on World News Tonight. Picking up the pieces, Pakistan faces a national security crisis after the deadly suicide bombing attack. Pension reforms, France braces for another round of protest with disrupted services in transportation. COVID still a pandemic. After three years, the WHO says the COVID pandemic still remains a global emergency. Back to business. After a long string of celebrations, Wuhan City gets their head in the game again. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and you are joining us on World News. Now tonight we have updates on the deadly suicide bombing that occurred in Pakistan. The nation has ramped up security measures in the area as more were confirmed dead in the marathon search of rubble. The death toll now reaching almost 100 and is expected to rise even further. The following visuals of this story is graphic. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. This is the aftermath of a suicide bombing at a crowded mosque in Pakistan's Peshawar. More than 40 people died in the attack on Monday, according to city officials, in the latest violence targeting police in the northwestern city. Hospital officials said scores were wounded, with many of them in a critical condition. A police official said that there were at least 260 people in the mosque when the explosion happened. Peshawar is an area where Islamist militants remain active, though no one immediately claimed responsibility for the bombing. The blast ripped through the mosque during noon prayers, causing a wall to collapse on top of worshippers. The building is inside a highly fortified compound that includes the headquarters of the provincial police force and a counter-terrorism department. The country's defence minister told Pakistani station GOTV that authorities believe the terrorist was stood in the first row. Peshawar sits at the edge of Pakistan's tribal districts bordering Afghanistan. It's frequently targeted by militant groups, including the Pakistani Taliban. The group, known as tariq e taliban Pakistan, or TTP, is an umbrella of Sunni and sectarian Islamist groups. They want to overthrow the government and replace it with their own brand of Islamic governance. The TTP has stepped up attacks since it ended a so-called peace deal last year with the Pakistani government, facilitated by Afghan Taliban. It staged frequent attacks targeting the police in the last few months. Australia's nuclear safety agency said it had joined the hunt for a tiny radioactive capsule missing somewhere in the outback, sending a team with specialized car-mounted and portable detection equipment. The capsule contains a small quantity of radioactive caesium-137, which is an extremely reactive metal that is mostly used to trigger hydro-based explosions and could cause serious illness to anyone who comes into contact with it. Authorities have now been on a week-long search for the capsule, which is believed to have fallen from a truck that had travelled some 1,400 kilometres in Western Australia. The loss triggered a radiation alert for large parts of the vast state. The Australian Radiation Protection and Nuclear Safety Agency said it was working with the Western Australian government to locate the capsule. It added that the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation has also sent radiation service specialists as well as detection and imaging equipment. People have been told to stay at least 5 metres away as exposure could cause radiation burns for radiation skinness through experts have said driving past the capsule would be relatively low risk, akin to taking an X-ray. The French are to strike again over pension reforms in a new test for President Macron. French police departments are preparing their officers for a nationwide protest, while unions warn there will be more stoppages to come. These are the images of the parliamentary commission that is preparing the controversial pension reform promoted by the French government. The project delays the minimum retirement age from 62 to 64. Some 7,000 amendments have been tabled, 6,000 of them from President Macron's left-wing opponents. And this Tuesday, the unions are planning to bring the country to a standstill with a general strike day, which will seriously affect public transport. 
According to union sources, 20% of flights at Paris or Lille Airport will be cancelled. The Paris Metro will operate at 50% or even 25%, while buses at 80% and long-distance trains at 25%. The government insists that the delay to 64 years is non-negotiable, despite the street pulse presented by the unions. French police departments say they are expecting more than a million people to take to the streets. The move was part of Macron's mandate when he was re-elected president in April 2022. It's been nearly three years since the WHO declared COVID-19 a global emergency and the UN health body's chief say the pandemic will still keep its status. Despite calling for continued vigilance, Dr. Tedros says that he's hopeful that the world will transition out of the emergency phase of the pandemic this year. After almost three years of the COVID-19 pandemic, the World Health Organization Director General Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus said Monday that COVID-19 remains a global health emergency. The comments came as a WHO's emergency committee met last Friday and advised Tedros that the virus remains a public health emergency of international concern, the UN agency's highest alert level. The decision also comes as the U.S. earlier this month extended its public health emergency until April. The WHO chief also noted that the world is in a far better place than it was a year ago when the Omicron variant first swept the globe, adding that at least 90 percent of the world's population has some level of immunity to COVID-19 due to vaccination or infection. However, he stressed the need for continued vigilance as the latest reports show that the numbers still remain a concern globally. Dr. Tedros last month said he was hopeful that the world will transition out of the emergency phase of the pandemic this year, which would mean hospitalizations and deaths have dropped to the lowest possible level and health systems are able to manage COVID-19 in an integrated and sustainable way. With Israel on its highest terror alert, an alarming spike in Israeli-Palestinian violence and sharp responses by both sides are testing the Biden administration as U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken plunges into a cauldron of deepening mistrust and anger on visits to Israel and the West Bank this week. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken arrived in Israel on Monday in the midst of some of the worst violence in months between Israelis and Palestinians and called on both sides to tamp down the bitter tensions. It's the responsibility of everyone to take steps to calm tensions rather than inflame them, to work toward a day when people no longer feel afraid in their communities, in their homes, in their places of worship. Last week, a Palestinian gunman opened fire in Jerusalem, killing seven Israelis. That attack came after the Palestinian Islamic Jihad militant group fired rockets from the Gaza Strip into Israeli territory, and Israel responded with airstrikes on the blockaded enclave. A day before the rocket fire, Israeli security forces carried out a raid on the West Bank city of Jenin that left 10 Palestinians dead. Blinken met Monday with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and both men underscored the, quote, ironclad alliance between their two countries. Netanyahu praised American President Joe Biden's long support for Israel. This alliance is something that President Biden is committed to. I've known him for 40 years. He's a true friend of Israel, a true champion of this alliance, as are you. But Blinken also affirmed the U.S. administration's support for a negotiated two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which would create a Palestinian state in territories captured by Israel in a 1967 war, a message Netanyahu may find hard to swallow. President Biden remains fully committed to that goal. We continue to believe that the best way to achieve it is through preserving and then realizing the vision of two states. As I said to the Prime Minister, anything that moves us away from that vision is, in our judgment, detrimental to Israel's long-term security and its long-term identity as a Jewish and democratic state. Netanyahu has long disdained resuming direct peace talks with Palestinians, and his new hardline government includes partners who oppose Palestinian statehood. Further complicating efforts at negotiations, Palestinians are politically divided between Palestinian Authority leader Mahmoud Abbas, who favors diplomacy, and rival Hamas Islamists, who are sworn to Israel's destruction. The last round of U.S.-sponsored talks on founding a Palestinian state alongside Israel stalled in 2014. Blinken was due to meet Abbas on Tuesday. We're going into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News.
Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, Brazil's former President Jair Bolsonaro has applied for a six-month U.S. tourist visa. Jair Bolsonaro has been staying in Florida since the 30th of December. The former president plans to stay in the United States while immigration officials process the visa. Jair Bolsonaro has applied for a six-month tourist visa to remain in the United States. That's despite calls to revoke any visas held by the former Brazil president following violent protests in his home country. His lawyer said the United States received his application on Friday and that Bolsonaro will remain in the U.S. while his application is pending. Bolsonaro flew to Florida two days before his term ended on January 1st and leftist president Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva took office. While in Florida, Bolsonaro supporters violently stormed Brazil's capital, calling for a military coup to overturn the October election. Bolsonaro is currently being investigated by Brazil's Supreme Court for his role in the anti-democratic protests. Earlier this month, dozens of Democratic House members asked the White House to cooperate with the investigation and to revoke any U.S. visas held by Bolsonaro. The State Department has repeatedly said its policy is not to discuss specific visa cases. It's believed Bolsonaro entered the country on a so-called A-visa, reserved for diplomats and heads of state. In an email response to Reuters, his lawyer said that Bolsonaro would like to enjoy being a tourist in the United States for a few months before deciding what his next step will be. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky fiercely expressed his disappointment at the International Olympic Committee's recent statement in which it supported Russian athletes return to international sports competitions. The IOC indicated it favors official neutral teams from Russia and its allies Belarus at the 2024 Olympics in Paris, despite a plea from Zelensky to exclude them entirely. It's a thinly veiled threat. The Ukrainian president warning against the participation of Russian and Belarusian athletes during the 2024 Olympics. As we prepare for the Paris Olympics, we must be sure that Russia will not be able to use it or any other international sports event to promote aggression or its state chauvinism. Last week, the International Olympic Committee indicated that there could be room for Russian and Belarusian athletes to compete. It's that it was necessary to explore a pathway for their participation under strict conditions. One of these is that they would not be allowed to represent their countries, a proposal that's failed to please either Kyiv or Moscow. I would like to underline once again that any attempts to squeeze Moscow out of international sports are doomed to fail. This should be understood by those who say they stand for high moral principles and the separation of sport from politics. What politics? She appeared to be taking a stab at French President Emmanuel Macron, who in the lead-up to the World Cup in Doha had called for not politicizing sports. With the Olympics taking place on home turf, French authorities are being put on the spot. Russia's participation in the Olympics in recent years has been marred by controversy. Between doping scandals and the Sochi Winter Games, which were tainted by the Maidan protests in Ukraine. Several Ukrainian athletes even decided to quit the Games. Former British Prime Minister Boris Johnson says Russian President Vladimir Putin personally threatened him with a missile attack in the run-up to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, a claim quickly denied by the Kremlin. Further, there were no records of such a call ever being made, according to the British Prime Minister's office. Boris Johnson, the former British Prime Minister, claims the Russian president said he could have sent a missile to hit Britain within a minute. Johnson says the comment was made on a phone call shortly before Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine. He revealed this in a three-part documentary for BBC Two. But the Kremlin has rejected the claims. No, what Mr. Johnson said is not true. More, it is a lie. Moreover, this are a conscious lie. Then you need to ask Mr. Johnson for what purpose he chose this version of presentation. Or was it unconscious? And in fact, he did not understand what President Putin was telling him. In the BBC interview, Johnson assures Putin replied that he did not want to hurt him. The British leader has never been on good terms with his Russian counterpart and was one of Ukraine's strongest supporters since the beginning of the war. 
Czech President-elect Peter Pavel vowed to boost his country's ties with Taiwan after holding a phone call with his island's president and the foreign minister. President Tsai Ing-wen congratulated Pavel on his win in Saturday's presidential runoff over the populist billionaire Andre Babish. Cheered by his supporters, Peter Pavel takes to the stage together with his wife after a resounding victory. I'd like to thank not just those who voted for me, but everyone who cast their ballot. Reports suggest that an unusually high number of voters took part in the election after just over 70% of those registered went to the polls following weeks of debate centred on Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The former army chief not only supported his country's alliance with NATO, but also backed the government's own efforts to help Kyiv. The Czech Republic has done all in its power to help Ukraine. I am proud that we were one of the first to defend them. But his opponent opted for a different strategy. Andrei Babish, who formerly served as Prime Minister, sought support from residents who were worried about the consequences of the conflict. When asked whether he would send troops to Ukraine in the event that Russia attacked Poland or any of the Baltic countries, he said... No, certainly not. I want peace, not war. Never would I send our children to the front line. Babish later backtracked, saying he supported NATO's efforts. Pavel will replace Milos Zeman, who cut close ties with Moscow when Putin invaded Ukraine last year. While presidential powers are limited in the Czech Republic, Pavel has vowed to restore order in the country and he'll be charged with naming a new prime minister after he's sworn in in March. Welcome back to World News tonight and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Croatian President Zoran Milanovic said in remarks detailing his objection in Shagreb providing military aid to Kyiv that Crimea, the Black Sea Peninsula annexed by Russia in 2014, will never again be part of Ukraine. NATO will continue to strengthen its partnership with Japan amid the ongoing war in Ukraine. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg said during a visit to Japan where he will meet with Prime Minister Fumio Kishida. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz said he was delighted about Brazil's return to the world stage with the election of President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva in a visit to Brasilia marking a reset in relations. With violent clashes between anti-government protesters and police in Peru likely to stretch into another month, alarm is growing amongst the business owners in Lima as they struggle to keep their shops afloat. The country is on the brink of a recession as GDP data for the fourth quarter of 2022 showed an unexpected contraction. According to data released, Europe's largest economy saw its gross domestic product fall by 0.2% quarter on quarter. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you've missed to watch any of the stories we add tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we leave you tonight with the traditional Chinese dragon going back to sleep as the Wuhan city gets back to work after the Spring Festival. Thank you for watching. Stay safe and have a good night.